Well, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, GasTech webinar uh, supported by Energy Connects. My name is Chris Klukas. I'm the uh, principal at Liquify Gas Consultancy Limited and a long-standing member of the GasTech governing body. I'm delighted to say that we've got uh, more than 600 people from around all over the world for today's webinar, uh, which is on the subject of shipping in a low carbon world. And thanks to everyone for all your support. Uh, as usual, the, the benefit of these webinars is to both listen to the presentations and to ask questions. So we'll go through the presentations and we'll take the questions at the end. And I'd encourage you to um, use the Q&A function, which you have on your um, on your screens, and I will take as many as uh, is possible uh, during the time. So we will introduce our panelists, but um, just before we do, let me just remind you that the call for papers for the 2023 Gas Tech Conference is now open. This is a technical and commercial conference with uh, sessions on uh, hydrogen and climate uh, technology uh, integral to it. The exhibition and conference will be in Singapore the 5th to the 8th of September 2023. So really note that in your diaries and make sure you get uh, keep it clear. Um, if you want more information, just go onto the internet and please note that the call for papers is now open. So if you go on to www gastechevent.com dash forward slash that is call hyphen for hyphen papers that will get you into the um, uh, into the appropriate place for you to submit your abstracts so as with the previous uh, webinars in this series we're going to suggest uh, we're going to uh, showcase today sorry some of the uh, standout um, talks from the previous uh, conference in Milan, which some of you might not have had the chance to see for various reasons. And uh, so we're going to call upon um, the speakers that we've um, we've highlighted to um, to, to present uh, th their topics. These, as we say, are about shipping in the low carbon world, and they cover um, uh, fuel cells. Um, new tank, tank type technology and the the alternatives for hydrogen transportation, all in themselves quite fascinating projects. So, um, without any further ado, because you're here to listen to the speakers, not to me, let me introduce our first speaker, who is Sami Kenerva, who's the product uh, global manager with ABB Marine and Ports, who's going to talk about to us about high power fuel cell systems and their role in decarbonizing large ships. Sami, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. And, and, and thanks for everybody for, for watching. And, and I'm really, really honored to be here presenting. And uh, let's, let's go on with the topic and start with hydrogen. So, uh, if you think of, of uh, any zero carbon fuels, uh, what we imagine in the in the future, they are mostly based on green hydrogen, uh, some biofuels or nuclear as an exception, but 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 really most of them uh, are focused on hydrogen. But but as we store the the fuel on board the vessel, uh, we may use some some different forms. Uh, we could have a hydrogen in, in directly in compressed or liquefied form. But or, or we could have some some liquid uh, organic carriers or some other type of metal hybrid carriers. But also when combining with uh, with the CO2 or or N2, we may have a have a have it stored in a, in a form of synthetic fuel, some hydrocarbons or ammonia. And regardless of what is our uh, fuel on board, uh, we are still. Uh, uh, free to select from different kinds of, of uh, machinery to produce the energy. So we may have a combustion engine or, or a gas turbine or a fuel cell. And in this, this presentation, we are focusing on the fuel cells. So uh, let's take a look at uh, what, what does it do. I think most of you or all of you probably know, understand the fuel cells are producing 
producing electricity out of hydrogen and uh, and and they, they may also use some other forms of, of fuel but they are actually turning that fuel into hydrogen internally in that that, that respect but the benefit of fuel cells one of them is is that they have no local emissions on on board so they're they're exhaust basically if if uh, fed with hydrogen their exhaust is is uh, pure water vapor uh, mixed with mixed with air and uh they they operate on relatively high efficiency so t typically uh, it could be maybe around 5% percent percentage units higher than than uh, than than a combustion engine or or turbine and and uh, then then it, it it means that even if we have some electrical uh conversion in it uh after after the the, the fuel cell it, it's still the total total uh, efficiency can be higher and that uh partly uh, is is a uh, is a uh, beneficial if we are looking at the total cost of ownership through the life cycle at the moment fuel cells they may be a bit bit on the expensive side but as we think of what they are composed of they they don't really have that much uh expensive components so so when when the when when the production capacity and volumes go up with fuel cells we we can expect them to come come down with the price and at, and after some time we could fairly say that they they are really competitive in terms of total cost of ownership when looking at today's offering on marine fuel cells there are some products uh, available typically in range of 200 kilowatts or uh, up to 500 kilowatts that are in in a cabinet based or, or or some some other modular type of systems that can be imported as one piece and and in, installed in a in a room uh, in, engine room or 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 even even some simpler electrical room of a vessel and and uh this way uh, even larger systems can be built out of these smaller units while just having having more of them together in parallel and they are integrated through the electric network it could be a secret or the secret to to distribute the power and they can be in the same way connected in parallel with, with batteries or or uh, or uh, any other types of of uh, of machinery they could also run run in parallel with combustion engines so it's basically integrated into the power system and the, and the key of the of the system is really the the electric uh, distribution system but looking looking at the future uh, and, and and especially for large ships uh, it's it's clear that this this a few hundreds of kilowatts and scaling up by building uh, this like lego blocks is 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 probably not the most optimal way and therefore we foresee that that the that the, the future fuel cells there will be multi megawatt units that are are scaled up from this cabinet type solutions and uh, the key principle here is that it has then the balance of plant it is not anymore split into several uh, small cabinet units but but it is it is more industrial type balance of plant that is supplying a bunch of of fuel cell stacks uh, in in parallel and, and actually abb ha has uh, been developing this kind of concept together with ballard power systems for some time and this is an illustration of of such concept and and when designing this kind of system uh, it needs to have a specific focus on safety and how this uh, system is integrated into the other ship systems. As we are building this kind of system, usually below deck, it means that we need to take care of all, all the ventilation and air handling the air and, and, uh, and, and potential leakage, how to, how to make it, make it uh, safe. And this, this work uh, we've been now, now working for several years with the classification societies to to understand that both both sides that that what is what is really the the best practice for for marine fuel cells but then from the future maybe back to closer to to this uh, today today's solution and thinking of how to how to get along uh, get going with uh, with the uh, with the fuel cell solutions and uh basically thinking of of uh, purely hydrogen driven ships 
uh, we may consider it as as a reality for smaller vessels. But when when looking at the at the larger vessels, we can fairly say that the 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 way to get there is to take some some gradual steps, and and it it means that we will we will focus first on hybrid power systems, and that could mean that we we have a engines in a normal way, probably the diesel electric setup so that the engines will, will produce the electricity, but we may have a harbor use or some other spe specific case when, when we are operating in a zero, zero emission way, uh, shutting down the engines and, and, and putting on the fuel cells or, or utilize shore power and charging batteries or, or the other, other such solutions. And the key here is, is really the, the electric distribution, as mentioned before, and then it also takes uh, gives a recommendation to use electric propulsion in a way. And this is keep giving, giving the flexibility to operate with hy hybrid systems and, and, uh, and take feasible steps uh, so that for first maybe replacing one or two of the gensets and, and, and then, then later on the later design and then, then uh, focus on the full, full fuel cell installation. And while this is all built together, it also also takes some uh, advanced uh, optimization of of the uh, of the power management system that, to understand that when when it is uh, best to use use uh, the engines and when when batteries, when fuel cells, and and how to make it make it the most optimal also in terms of the fuel cost and operational cost. But thinking of these hybrid systems. And what what it may need, mean in practice? Uh, th here's one example of a of a as well a concept uh, that is uh, a retrofitting uh, a tanker with with fuel cells, and it it's uh, it can start with with a sim simply replacing a single auxiliary genset uh, with a with a fuel cell genset, and as as this example is is an LNG carrier. Uh, there, there will be a reformer to, to, to produce the hydrogen, but also a carbon capture from the output stream of the reformer to, and, and then store the CO2 in a tanks and, 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 and get rid of it in, an, in a nice way, uh, sell it out since CO2 has also a, a market price. And especially when we look, look ahead uh, as, uh, as, as the fuel full uh, recycling period uh, or recycling cycle for for the fuels. It means that if if the LNG is actually a synthetic one produced from hydrogen by by uh, combining it with with CO2, then then after after using it, we can get the CO2 back to the to the process. So that will that that is actually in the end uh, driving us towards a carbon neutral shipping. But as as well here. Uh, Let's not try to make it make it all happen at once. It may be a too big big chunk to take, but but uh, let's take step by step. So so if we start from a single single auxiliary genset, uh, giving giving uh, just a minor reduction of 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 the CO2 footprint, and later on we may we may replace possibly more uh, generators, or or we could have a have a PTI PTO uh, to 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 uh, add in the the power into propulsion or even have a gearbox with a with a hybrid system with with a the mechanical and, and and electric propulsion as well. So it's it gives enormous steps and and uh, different r ratios to to get get along and reduce the footprint step by step. So so there is no no need to to wait for. The technology to be ready for the huge step. We can we can proceed really really by small steps and find out that when when it's uh, the best uh, best timing for each solutions. And this work, uh, like co considering reformers uh, to produce hydrogen on board and then operate on hydrogen, uh, it it may uh, at first glance sound sound like it, there are too many processes and, and too many con conversions on the way. But but we this work has been started, and this is another example which is much closer to reality. Since since this this is a uh, this hydrogen one project is is a tow boat that is 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 going to be built 
in in 23, I believe, uh, in 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 the U.S. And and it will have a it will operate on methanol and it will have a reformer to produce hydrogen and there will be a, a PEM fuel cell to to produce electricity, electric propulsion and battery. So it is it is really all, all this uh, squeezed in, in into a small towboat and and this is going to be a really exciting project to to see how they all fit together and what what are actually the the findings and and how do we need to need to develop it further. So so this is this is already happening and taking place and this this is uh, going to be a really important important step in the development and then uh finally uh just a reminder on on how this this uh process of of emission reduction is going to proceed uh, it, it, it this is an image by dnv and it is a uh, it is somehow describing the way how how these regulations will get tighter and stricter uh, time after time. So so there will be a few years uh, period when when you need to when you can still operate on certain certain uh, carbon intensity and then you must reduce it somehow, either reducing the speed of the vessel or scrapping the vessel and, and building new ones or or whatever is is the way. And and the the higher the the, the carbon footprint of, of your vessel is the higher is the risk that it may become outdated at some time. But it also is giving the impression that that there is no need to to actually do all the changes at once. But but if if uh, this this uh, transition is planned in a stepwise way, it's also possible to 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 make it gradually, especially on an existing vessel. It's possible to retrofit. Uh, the the generators replace maybe maybe one generator first and then later on make a major uh, major conversion of engine to fuel cells if it's needed by by the regulations and and and, and this will give uh, also freedom to to follow the development how it, how is it going where where is the technical development and don't need to take these steps too early. So it's also possible to wait until you really see what is available and what is required, and, and in this respect, uh, extend the lifetime of the vessel in a, in a controlled way. So uh, I'm um, at the end of my presentation here, and I, I'm looking forward to then then to hear the next ones, and also in the end also to reply to any any questions you may have. Sami, thank you very much indeed. Well, wonderful for any uh, moderator to have the first speaker um, complete their talk on time and actually, frankly, ahead of time and, and on budget. And you've uh, made some very interesting points there, which I can see already uh, on the Q&A. We've got um, questions coming in. So um, let's, uh, well, we'll think about the, the presentation as we listen as you're like me, Sammy. I want to hear the others as well. Um, or listen to the other presentations. But I, I really was tickled when you said about um, introducing the fuel cells into a simple uh, electric room on a ship. Well, us plumbers who are used to working on the deck pipe work, we go down and look at these rooms on the uh, switchboard and so on. And uh, I actually call it electricery. So um, it's a little bit beyond my, uh, my, my poor physicist brain, I'm afraid. So uh, thank you very much indeed. But I'm sure we're all much more enlightened about the possibilities and the scope of fuel cells now. And I've marked down this Hydrogen One project as something we should be hearing more about at GasTech in Singapore next, uh, uh, next September. Sammy, thank you. So take a rest now till we come to the questions and answers. And now let me call upon our next speaker, um, who I have uh, met on various occasions. And I have to confess, I have a personal interest. My introduction to LNG carriers was on Type A type ships, um, the early ones back in the 70s. And so it always fascinates me. So can I call on, please, um, Kettle Shirley Strand? who is the chief executive of LNT Marine to talk about the uh, the new developments in the type A ships and how these are going to open up some of the market for um, these this low carbon 
uh, fuel, uh, LNG, and also looking to the future for other cargoes. Kettle, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for introduction, Chris, um, and thanks for the opportunity to speak at this webinar. Uh, my presentation will cover an introduction to the development project, which this is all about, uh, some background for the development, and some highlights on large-scale LNG carriers, and finally, some more details on the development of aluminum tanks. So let's start with the introduction part. The development covered in this presentation is part of a development project together with some major industry players. The main objectives are the following. To enable more yards to build LNG carriers and create more competition, to unlock new markets for LNG, and to develop and optimize LNG carrier designs. So I will spend a few minutes to explain these objectives slightly more in detail. The market for design, development, and construction of large-scale LNG carriers is today close to what we can call a monopoly. In order to facilitate some more competition and flexibility in this field, there is a need for solutions that can enable more shipyards to build LNG carriers. When we say unlock new markets, we mean import of LNG into new emerging markets. These markets are typically lacking large-scale infrastructure and often located in geographical regions with shallow waters. Thus, they will need mid-scale vessels to be developed. Finally, the development project seeks to optimize the science and prepare for commercialization of the vessels needed for the future. The development is based on the LNTA box containment system, which has been used on only one LNG carrier one so far. Thus, we are humble enough to realize that there is still a lot of improvement and industrialization to be done on the building process. So before we go into the details, I will spend also a few minutes on, on the background of the LNTA box containment system and status and experience so far. The LNTA box is a containment system for LNG developed by LNT Marine over the last 10 years plus. The technology is based on an IMO independent tank type A as the primary barrier. The insulation is not fitted to the tank itself, but instead placed on the inner hull of the compartment. And the inner surface of the insulation is designed as a full secondary barrier. Between the tank and the insulation, we have what we call the cold interbarrier space. And finally, there is the cargo tank support system, which is keeping the tank in its position and acting as a thermal break between the tank and the surrounding hull structure. The first vessel based on the LNTA box was a 45,000 cubic LNG carrier built at China Merchants and delivered in early 2020. Since then, she has been operating in Southeast Asia, mainly importing LNG to a medium-scale terminal in southern China. Besides loading from conventional LNG plants, she has loaded three export cargoes from a hub terminal and also received cargoes from ship-to-ship -ship transfer operations with a large-scale carrier. The vessel has also carried part cargoes at around 50% loading, and as such, she has demonstrated the full range of capabilities and flexibility of this design. From a technical point of view, the cargo containment systems, uh, system has performed very well. We have not had any issues reported uh, related to, to the containment so far. On the contrary, we have received positive feedbacks from all parties involved. And the main point in the feedback is that the term temperature of the system is very stable during all operations, which enables very smooth and efficient loading operations. So, when it comes to the LNTA box technology, we can now say with confidence that it works to build and it works in operation. Now, the question is, what does it take to scale up to the large-scale segment? So, let's look into the large-scale LNG carrier segment. <clears throat> First of all, it's useful to establish a benchmark, i.e., what are we up against in this segment? 
the MOS type LNG carriers with spherical type B tanks used to dominate these markets. The market has, however, been taken over by membrane systems, which is today considered as the industry standard. Next, we need to identify the most important performance indicators for large-scale LNG, LNG carriers. Even though I'm a naval architect myself, I realize that everything is essentially measured in costs and money. But behind the CapEx, OPEX, and voyage costs, there are, however, factors driven by the technical features of the, of the ships, such as weights, boil-off rates, resistance, and tonnage. And in addition, there are some more qualitative, as, qualitative aspects, such as constructability, safety, and reliability. Together with CSSC Starry, we are, have developed a design for a 175,000 cubic LNG carrier based on the LNT A box. So, in the following slides, we will review how this design may perform on some of these technical parameters. Weight is important for both capex and for the hydrodynamic performance of the vessel. The weight of the cargo tanks will be somewhat higher for an LNTA box type carrier than for a membrane vessel. Therefore, weight optimization uh, of the tank will be an important part of the development. Aluminum has the potential to reduce the tank weight significantly, and I will get more back to that in the last part of the presentation. Uh, the containment systems uh, constitutes, however, more than only the cargo tank itself. In the LNT A box system, all the static and dynamic loads from the tank and its cargo is transferred to the whole structure through the cargo tank support system. This means that the <clears throat> insulation system is not exposed to such loads, and compressive strength of the insulation is not an issue. This is completely different from membrane vessels, whereas the insulation system has to carry all the loads and consequently membrane insulation has to be designed for high compressive strength. <clears throat> As illustrated in the diagram here, this gives a significant difference in the density of the PU foam being used in the insulation system in order to achieve the required compressive strength. Consequently, an lnt -A box type LNG carrier will have an insulation system which is lighter than the insulation system of a membrane type carrier. And thus, this will counter some of the difference in the tank weight. But this point is not only important for the weight, but also for the thermal performance. As you may see in the lower diagram, the low density PU foam has significantly lower thermal conductivity than high density PU foam. This means that for the same thickness of insulation, an LNT A box type LNG carrier will always have better thermal performance and lower boil off rate than for a membrane vessel. Resistance of the hull is essential for the fuel consumption and voyage costs. IMO independent tank type A and the LNT A box system offers a high degree of geometrical flexibility which gives the ship designer freedom to design an efficient hull form. Starry has used their rich experience and CFD evaluations to optimize the hull lines for the LNT A box type carrier. Despite the high, slightly higher weight, we see that the preliminary resistance predictions, as well as model tests, which was recently carried out, indicate resistance and fuel consumption approximately 4% below comparable membrane vessels. Uh, as I already mentioned, the LNT A box offers geometrical flexibility. This leads also to better utilization of the volume in the forward part of the hull and aft close to the engine room. In addition, there is actually a regulatory advantage in favor of independent tank types compared to membranes when it comes to distance from the tank to the outer shell. Our plots of gross tonnage as a function of cargo capacity, as illustrated on the right-hand side here, shows that LNT A box designs offers market-leading tonnage. Okay, so let's revert to the tanks and, and weight optimization. When 
um, I'm a type A tank shall carry LNG at minus 163 degrees. There are basically three options for the cargo tank material. That is stainless steel, nickel alloys, and aluminum. These materials have quite different properties. And a key difference is the lower density and weight of the aluminum. <clears throat> Material costs are, of course, highly dynamic and varying with market factors. But in general, we see that aluminum may typically be slightly more expensive uh, per weight unit than stainless steel, but cheaper than 9% nickel steel. Fabrication and welding of aluminum are, however, more complicated and more limited, and consequently the fabrication cost per weight unit are typically significantly higher for aluminum than for steels. For the design development, together with CCC Starry, we are working on the design for the large-scale vessels based on aluminum tanks. Comparing with the baseline based on stainless steel, we see that we can reduce the tank weight with more than 50% by opting for aluminum. This is of significance not only for the weight but also of the tank, but also for the lightweight of the ship, uh, which will be reduced with close to 10%, and thus also important for the fuel economy. So what about the costs? If we multiply the tank weight with material costs and fabrication costs, we get the total cost of the tanks in respective materials. The preliminary analysis and current price levels indicate a direct saving on the tank cost in the range of 20% for aluminum compared to a baseline based on stainless steel again. This uh, preliminary design and analysis in the foregoing slides are based on a conventional structure design and fabrication based on fusion welding of aluminum A5083 O. This means that allowances have been made for reduced welded strength of aluminum, which is a consequence of the fact that aluminum is reducing or heat is reducing the strength of aluminum. Anyway, and as we saw in the previous slides, aluminum tank design will give a substantial weight reduction. As a step in this design development process, we are currently working on a mock-up with the representative structural details and welds, together with one of our industry partners in China, which will be uh, ready for presentation after Chinese New Year. Next, and as a further step in the optimization process, we are planning a detailed study on tank design and fabrication based on extrusions and, and friction stir welding. Extrusion of aluminum profiles is a procedure where the material is heated to near melting temperature and pressed through a tool, which gives the aluminum the desired shape. This gives the opportunity to produce large panel sections from extruded profiles by the aluminum manufacturer. Friction stir welding, or just FSV, is an automated welding technique comprising a rotating tool guided between the profile. This method is very fast and does not require filler material nor gas shield. Consequently, FSV does not reduce the strength of the material. Altogether, a design and construction process based on extrusions and FSV can give significant advantages, such as overall reduction of the welding as stiffeners are integrated as part of the extruded profiles, reduction of on-site welding as complete panels can be supplied by the manufacturers, Reduced weight, since the strength of, of the FSV is equal to the strength of the material itself. And optimized uh, material usage as waste is basically elimin eliminated. <clears throat> so all this together gives an additional upside potential compared to the figures already presented here. Okay, so that brings us to the summary. To sum up, we see that large-scale LNG carriers based on IMO type A tanks in aluminum has the potential to reduce costs and shorten the lead time.
system compared to the current industry standards. We do believe that it is in the interest of the entire industry to bring forward a new alternative for large-scale LNG carriers and to create some more competition and flexibility in this market. Thank you. Kettle, I shall say Thanks. tusen tak for there. Thank you. Per Thanks. Kindly, perfectly delivered on time and uh, a very good summary of uh, your experience so far with your design, uh, the successful introduction um, where you've gone in um, a modern, a modest size ship, a mid sized ship, and you're looking to scale up, which is logical to me. Uh, you have succeeded in your boil off. Uh, you've had no cold spots and your prototype uh, first stage has um, uh, certainly shown the way to open up the, the market for for this uh, these size of vessels. So um, let's hope we hear some more and we've already got some questions coming in. And uh, what I think is going to be a golden age for naval architects, what with new designs and retrofits and uh, all sorts of developments in this uh, low carbon uh, um, scenario which we are, are, are entering into. So, Chettle, thank you very much. Please stay around the, in Oslo there, ready to take the questions to the end, after we've heard from our final presenter, Molly Eiliff, who's a director of ERM. And we've heard already a little bit about um, hydrogen and how hydrogen's affecting uh, the shipping. And Molly's going to talk about hydrogen storage, transport and use in the marine context, learnings from trials that have taken place. So Molly, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, coming last, you've already heard the really fantastic presentations from the other presenters. So I hope this offers a, a slightly different perspective. Um, so I'll just hop on to the next slide. Um, so yes, my name is Molly Eiliff. I'm a director with ERM, and I'll be talking to you today about um, hydrogen storage transporting use in a marine context, and in particular sharing some um, learnings from industrial scale trials that ERM has been designing over the past year or so. So I'll briefly highlight the role that hydrogen carriers can play in the development of the hydrogen market. Then I'll introduce liquid organic hydrogen carriers, um, just in case this is a, a new concept to you, and explain some of the pros and cons they have compared to other hydrogen carriers. And then I'll go on to explain three different hydrogen carrier trials and um, why they're really interesting and the insights that they've offered so far. Um, who is ERM? So ERM is the world's largest pure play environmental health and safety risk and sustainability consultancy. It's present across more than 40 countries and has more than five and a half thousand people. And it has expertise across the hydrogen value chain. Um, I am a director based in the UK and I lead ERM's commercial hydrogen services for large scale infrastructure projects. And I also lead the commercial development plan for the ERM Dolphin uh, Green Hydrogen Project, which I'll explain in a moment. So the global hydrogen opportunity. So governments representing more than 70% of global GDP have committed to net zero and recognize that hydrogen is an absolutely critical component of that. And by about 2050, it should be um, providing around 20 to 25% of global decarbonization. And the market could reach about $30 trillion by then. But there's a missing link in the hydrogen value chain, and that's the need to transport and store hydrogen in bulk because regions of low cost production are not co-located necessarily with regions of future high hydrogen demand. And that means that as the hydrogen market matures and um, hydrogen production projects stop being co-located with an anchor off taker and instead sell into a merchant market, a global hydrogen market will develop, which will be enabled by hydrogen carriers. And those hydrogen carriers will enable um, a, a shift in terms of um, the flows of energy around the world from where they are now. And we'll see the bulk transportation of hydrogen from regions of excellent renewables resource or natural gas and CCS. Okay, so this slide shows some of our uh, research that ERM did recently for um, the Scottish government and some other partners. Um, and it uh, summarized some of the main um, 
benefits and pros and cons of different types of hydrogen carriers, because there are a range of different carriers. Um, as you can see from the graph on the bottom right hand side, there's little difference between the options from a commercial perspective. Um, liquid hydrogen is a bit more expensive at the moment, just because it's at a, a bit more of a lower TRL, um, a smaller scale. Um, but there isn't that much difference between the other carriers from a commercial perspective. It's likely that instead the requirements of the off-taker will be the key differentiating factor in which hydrogen carrier is optimal. And it's also likely the different environmental and health and safety considerations and properties of the carriers will be a key differentiator. So although ammonia has been an early winner in this space because it has an established supply chain and market, it's highly toxic in a marine environment and it may be difficult to get regulatory approval for storage in populated areas um, or transportation on inland European waterways. Similarly, um, liquid hydrogen is highly flammable and very costly to store at present. And for methanol, you need a sustainable source of carbon. So they all have um, some cons associated with them. Liquid organic hydrogen carriers, or LOHCs, are oil-like substances um, that can be used as hydrogen carriers. And um, examples include uh, benzyl toluene and methyl cyclohexane. They enable large volumes of hydrogen to be stored with a similar hydrogen density as liquid hydrogen. However, unlike liquid hydrogen, the LOHC is stored at ambient temperature and pressure, um, usually, and therefore it does not require highly insulated and pressurized containment. Um, LOHCs also have low flammability generally in liquid form and do not have the high toxicity of other hydrogen carriers such as ammonia, um, therefore having significant EHS benefits, which could be the deciding factor in some use cases. So this diagram shows a typical LOHC transportation process. The hydrogen is combined with the LOHC in a process called hydrogenation, which requires very high pressure and temperature. So it's a very energy intensive process at the moment, although there's a lot of innovation going around, on around that space, different catalysts and so on. The LOHC is then transported via marine tanker to the receiving port, where the hydrogen is separated from the LOHC in a process known as dehydrogenation. The tanker with the depleted LOHC is then sent back to the original port to be hydrogenated again. So it's a circular um, process. OK, so on to some of the um, industrial scale trials that um, ERM has been designing um, in partnership with our um, funding partners who have included the UK government in particular and also the Scottish government and uh, various ports and OEMs. So the first trial is the ERM Cascade Tank LOHC system um, for hydrogen storage and delivery. And this is a design for a cascade tank system that can supply large quantities of hydrogen while minimizing the space requirements for tankage. Um, so a really useful concept on things like ships or in ports where there's limited land available. You can see a diagram of the tank system uh, on the left-hand side of this slide. Um, so rather than having two containment tanks, one for charged LOHC and the other for depleted LOHC, the system incorporates up to 10 individual tanks, which are linked in a cascade arrangement. Nine of these tanks are initially full of charged LOHC and one tank is empty. And then as the hydrogen is released from the LOHC, the returning depleted LOHC fills the empty tank until it is full. The tank next to it is then empty and becomes the receptacle for the third tank in line and so on. This continues down the line until all of the charged LOHC is depleted and it needs to be recharged again. So there's potential to integrate this system with a solid oxide fuel cell to provide a low carbon power generation system. Energy demand for the dehydrogenation unit could be supplied by waste heat from the solid oxide fuel cell. And this system enables a really small footprint compared to a conventional arrangement. Um, so it could be used in a range of applications. Um, in the top right hand side, you can see an example of it being used in domestic and commercial heating. Um, but due to the equipment scale that's available at the moment for the dehydrogenation technology, it's likely that commercial heating would realistically be more feasible than domestic heating. 
And this kind of system could also be used for a bunkering vessel that can supply large quantities of hydrogen at high pressure to local marine vessels in ports using a cargo of LOHC. Uh, the vessel would be a carrier of charged LOHC and designed to enable hydrogen to be released from the LOHC on board, and the depleted LOHC will be stored in the cascade tankage system. So while we've been designing this project um, using funding from the UK government, um, one of the key learnings um, from the design process so far has been the importance of the choice of LOHC because they all have different properties. Um, given the potential for ambient outdoor temperatures in the UK to be significantly lower than 15 degrees Celsius in winter, which we're feeling now, um, preheating of LOHC would likely be required for a benzyl toluene system whereas methyl cyclohexane has a viscosity that's similar to gasoline and wouldn't uh, need the same preheating in the same way. So it has implications for the design of the project. So a quick overview of the second trial. Um, so this one looks at the potential to repurpose equipment at an oil refinery um, to store and transport hydrogen in the UK. Again, this project was funded by the UK government. Um, so the design for this trial involves repurposing existing equipment and undertaking a controlled series of tests to demonstrate how LOHC performs in terms of its fluid behaviour, hydrogen retention and level of contamination from residual contaminants in the pipelines and storage tanks. Because the idea of this trial is that there's a lot of legacy oil and gas infrastructure in the UK, which is looking to transition towards an industry um, that uh, has long term low carbon future. So transitioning some of this infrastructure to LOHC in order to enable high bulk hydrogen production could be a really uh, useful um, uh, opportunity for those assets. Um, the initial um, conclusions of the study are focused on finalising the LOHC char characteristics and the suitability of repurposing different infrastructure based on those characteristics. And one of the key learnings from this project um, so far, similarly to the, the previous project, is that the choice of LOHC has a really important impact on the potential to repurpose existing equipment. Um, so, uh, for example, if we're looking at the potential to repurpose a gasoline pumping system, then the work we've done so far indicates that that would be much more suitable for a system using metal cyclohexane than benzyl uh, toluene. Uh, because of the different visco viscosities. Um, then to quickly introduce the third trial. So this one um, is funded by the Scottish Government and a number of different ports, OEMs and hydrogen developers. And ERM is in the second phase of designing an industrial scale trial to export hydrogen in bulk from two ports in Scotland to the port of Rotterdam. Um, the project will be essential to open up a market, um, a route to market for the bulk generation of green hydrogen from offshore wind in Scotland. As offshore wind projects increasingly move further from shore into remote regions, um, grid connection will become an issue and also grid charges become very high. And so producing hydrogen offers a really important route to market and that can be converted to LOHC and then transported to industrial demand centres. And because the northeast of Scotland has significant legacy oil and gas infrastructure and skills, there's a lot of potential to repurpose those for LOHC, which helps to optimise the business case and also to bring local communities um, on side. So ERM's in the process of designing this export trial and we should be able to uh, report more on that in the next six months to a year's time. Um, so just a quick note about an example of a project where LOHC is a real, um, really helps the commercial case. Um, LOHC can open up global markets for um, locally generated renewable resources. And the Dolphin project, which there's a picture of on this slide, is a great example of the type of offshore wind project which can be enabled by this type of LOHC deployment. Um, the project comprises a semi-submersible floating platform on which you have desalination equipment and electrolyzers, and hydrogen is generated on the platform and then exported to shore uh, via a flexible riser, which then links to a trunk pipeline. ERM is aiming to deploy a commercial demonstrator in the northeast of Scotland in 2025, with then a commercial scale project to follow. 
projects. And for remote dolphin projects like this in the north of Scotland, LOHC will offer a really important route to market. So just a few kind of key takeaways. Um, hydrogen carriers will be really key to link low cost production, storage and demand centers as the global hydrogen market develops. There are several options for hydrogen export carriers, each of which have pros and cons, and it's likely that different vectors will be optimal for different projects. Um, the off-taker is likely to be a key driver of the choice, um, but also EHS and project-specific factors, such as the potential to repurpose existing infrastructure, will be really important. Um, and when we're looking at the design of LOHC trials, um, important considerations include character the characteristics of the LOHC and also the potential to repurpose existing infrastructure and industrial heat um, for the dehydrogenation process. Um, LOHC comes from a lower base than ammonia or methanol in terms of existing suppliers and infrastructure, and this leads to a lot of uncertainty in the cost estimates for trial projects. Um, for example, the most significant contributor to the cost of the cascade tank system is the hydrogen release units, and this type item of equipment is still really small scale, and so the cost is highly uncertain. But having said that, high hydrogen carriers will be absolutely instrumental in the development of the hydrogen economy. So it'll be really interesting to see how this um, market opens up over the coming decade. Thank you. And our thanks to you, Molly, for, first of all, um, a fascinating presentation, and secondly, coming in on time, which is every um, uh, moderator's uh, delight. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right to focus on um, repurposing existing uh, equipment, because there is a lot of heritage equipment and, as you say, skills. And I was quite fascinated in a previous life. I used to be a chemist, and uh, we, we spent a lot of time studying ways of, of moving hydrogen around safely because it's um, quite a tricky um, molecule. And um, I remember uh, back in those days, lithium aluminium hydride. And I can see uh, that was a solid, of course, but um, uh, methyl cyclohexane I've written down and uh, benzyl toluene are well, really quite exotic organics. So I'll have to mug up on my organic chemistry to, um, uh, to, to get the benef benefit of all the, the knowledge in this area. Right, um, now we've got quite a few questions come in, and uh, I'm going to, if I may, group them, and I'd like to take, um, uh, and our, in the order of our presentations, um, Sami, um, there was a couple of questions come in to you about um, the, uh, the power, um, power cells, fuel cells, um, and if we use hydrogen for fuel cells, is the limitation going to be the space on the ship or the efficiency of the cells themselves? And um, what are the overriding design rules that will um, control the installation? Will this be class, IMO, IGC code, uh, IGF code? Uh, how would you see this developing? Uh, if I can ask you that one, Sami, please. Yeah, sure, Chris. Thanks. Uh I think the main main limitation actually is not not coming from the fuel cells, but the fuel itself. So if we have hydrogen driven fuel cells, it, it's clear that they, they, it's it's going to be the storage of hydrogen that is limiting, and that's that's why why uh, all these uh, uh, different carriers of of hydrogen or or uh, or synthetic fuels are being being studied, since that that will uh, compress the the volume so much or more effectively store the hydrogen on board that it, it enables to to have a have a higher energy stored on board so that is that is uh, i think the fuel cells themselves they are quite much in line with the combustion engines if we consider the power rating but it's it's really the hydrogen itself that is that is a challenge and so uh, our lim yeah our limitation is the fuel what i suspected Good. Yeah, 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 and and then about the the, the design drivers, uh, IGF code is is a uh, is a bit challenging since uh, it it is uh, not going to contain hydrogen for some years. It's it's on on the process, but it's really a slow process. But but uh, the classifications and also IMO they are they are together working on the or have have been already released this. Uh, these uh, guidelines, interim guidelines for fuel cells, and, and that is going to be the basis of the IGF code uh, 
quite quite far so so then uh it's it's uh basically it's it's finding its its way and it's already quite far we could say that it is it is the IMO and the classification societies uh, in collaboration that are that are uh, actually setting the design rules and of course with a with a close close attendance of the of the equipment suppliers and designers as well so it is all all to it's it we could say that it's it's really a common challenge and and everybody is working together to make it make it uh, safe and and uh, applicable I was just going to say that um, the regulations are nothing without the equipment makers. So I was going to say you, you shouldn't be too modest there. The um, the advances that you and your colleagues are making uh, are, are definitely very interesting. And also, um, when we talk about hydrogen, um, it is basically how you get the stuff from A to B. And um, if I may turn to Kettle, please. Um, there are a couple of questions come in about uh, your presentation, which again was quite fascinating. Um, one of the things that uh, did cross my radar was um, if the Type A tank system would ever be um, suitable for liquid hydrogen in bulk, the um, minus 250 degrees Celsius. And the second question is really, um, when it comes to bulk, hide, uh, bulk uh, LNG shipping, is there much more that we can do to improve the efficiency? So, Kettle, if you could perhaps um, take those two points before I come on to a couple of queries for Molly that have come in. So, thank you, Kettle. Yeah, uh, yeah. when it comes to liquid hydrogen, that's, of course, a, a major challenge. Uh, we have had some initial discussions and evaluations on that, but we would need certain redesign to make that feasible. Uh, for instance, now we have the what we call the cold inter barrier space inverted with nitrogen gas, which would be liquid if we had the uh, if we had the hydrogen inside the tank. So, so <laughs> then we would need to add some more insulation on the tank before so, so we ensure a higher temperature in the in the barrier space at least. <laughs> But I can mention that we have uh, earlier this year uh, done uh, um, a proven principle process together with ABS uh, and reviewed the tank system both under the IGC and IGF code and got an approval for the system for ammonia applications. So of course that's maybe a more likely hydrogen carrier uh, in, in, in such large quantities as we're talking about here. I think you're right. So that's, uh, that was the first one, and, and the second was... Can we optimize further on the LNG design? Th there's, of course, always room for optimization uh, on every aspect. And, and, of course, considering uh, both costs and not at least the climate, a few percentage here and a few percentage there is always valuable if it is the hydrodynamic efficiency or other things. But, of course, for us, being a containment system provider, boil off rates from from uh, on the tank is a key thing because even though we have a reliquification plant it takes quite a lot of energy to run yes. relic plants yes. and, and and again uh, turning going back to this uh, inter barrier space that i mentioned since we now have an um, inter barrier space from 600 millimeters between the tank and the insulation system the pu panels there is a potential to utilize this space even with insulating gases or, or removable uh, thermal insulation in that space. So we have actually done calculations and, and see that it's absolutely feasible for a large scale carrier to bring the boiler rate down to 0.05% per day, which would be quite remarkable compared to what the industry standards are today. Thank you, that'll uh, certainly add a lot to the efficiency of the process. Okay, thank you. And uh, finally, uh, Molly, um, almost inevitably, um, questions are focusing on what are the optimum um, hydrogen carrying uh, chemicals that you've seen at the moment. You mentioned uh, the two which are not that well known industrially on an industrial scale. And are you looking at any others? That was one thing. And the second thing, I think you, you mentioned something about solid oxide fuel cells. Um, is there anything more you want to mention about that? So Molly, the, the microphone is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so part of the purpose of uh, the work that we're doing is to identify which hydrogen carriers um, are 
or which LOHCs are best in which use cases? So I, I see there's a question on, you know, what's the best LOHC and, and things like that. And part of it is that some of them are optimal depending on what the use case is that you're looking like. What are the operation, operating conditions that the LOHC will need to be used and what's the equipment that you're using it for? Um, but the two that I mentioned there, so methylcyclohexone, which is the um, half of the Chioda pairing um, based in Japan, and then the benzyl toluene, which is half of the pairing used by Hydrogenius, which is a company based in Germany. The reason why we investigated those in particular detail was because those are the two options which are best advanced at the moment. There are other LOHC pairings out there. But we wanted um, pairings which uh, we would be able to uh, procure commercial equipment for that were realistic for our clients to then implement um, a trial if we designed that trial for them. Because the idea is we're not, you know, we're not doing something that's academic. We're doing something which is designing a trial which can then be implemented. Um, so, so that was why we chose those pairings, um, and the uh, you know the different LOHCs have different properties, different scales of equipment available, and um, things like that. So it may be that uh, you know in the future other pairings become commercially available, um, but uh, that was the reason why we chose those. Um, and the solid oxide fuel cells that was sort of an add-on to our um, research because it. it you know, this sector is moving so fast. You can scope out a research proposal, and then by the time you actually do it, you realize, oh, there's this other really interesting thing that we could add in that could make it a lot more useful for some use cases. And um, because one of the um, applications that we were particularly asked to look at was the potential to use LOHC to heat houses that are off the gas network in the UK. So mm -hmm. if the gas network is repurposed for hydrogen, um, that, you know, that's great for houses that are connected to that network. But if you're in a remote island location, for example, um, if you're in a remote location where that's not the case, you're currently getting your power through trucking in diesel, you need another alternative. And LOHC could be a really interesting option. So that was why we paired the system in that case with a solid oxide fuel cell, because we thought that would be a really interesting, it introduces a synergy because you can use... Um, the heat for the dehydrogenation process, which improves efficiencies and reduces, uh, you know, it improves the overall commercial viability of the project. Um, but it also then makes the system a lot more um, interesting for that use case. So that was why we introduced that that piece of technology. Thank, thank you. It was just I'd seen some references in the press, and uh, I was speaking to a moderator who lives on a somewhat remote island in the middle of the Irish Sea. Uh, we fortunately are piped in with natural gas rather than diesel, but I suppose maybe in the Scottish islands, maybe the um, uh, the Uists, North Uists, might have problems like that. I don't know, and I know you have some personal um, involvement with project there. So, okay, and well, that's interesting. Also, you're doing some more of this work and um, you're hoping, I think, to get some results next uh, year. So that would time in very nicely for the um, GasTech 23 um, presentations in Singapore in September, uh, the 5th to the 8th uh, of 2023. And Molly, I'd urge you, I'd urge all of our uh, other presenters and also anyone in our audience to um, look, at the, look up the call for papers, as I said, www gastechevent.com forward slash call for papers that's hyphenated and uh, please call in um, uh, uh, and submit your abstracts for that now one question that did come up uh, was uh, will you be receiving um, copies of the presentations the answer is yes and you'll receive um, an email um, that will give you the uh, access um, shortly and uh, that is our way of thanking you for attending. We're also giving you an extra five minutes of time. And I must thank our presenters for this. Um, we've had excellent presentations and excellent timing. and just let down by the moderator as usual. But um, let me uh, finally thank uh, Sami, Kettle and Molly for the, uh, the presentations, for the Gas Tech organization supported by Energy Connects for putting together this webinar and I look forward to um, being in touch with you all in the future. 
and uh, also to, to hearing more about these very interesting projects as we move forward. So from me and from the, presenta from the presenters, that's over and out for now. So thank you very much, and thank you for your attention, and thank you for all the input. Bye for now.